<clears throat> Thus, if I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pandika's Park, there he addressed the monks thus, Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said, Monks, uh, the Blessed One said this, Monks, whatever fear arise, all arise because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Whatever troubles arise, all arise because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Whatever calamities arise, all calamities arise because of the fool, not because of the wise man. Just as a fire that starts in a shed made of rush or grass burns down even houses with peaked roofs, with walls plastered inside and outside, shut off, secured by bars, with shuttered windows, so too, whatever fear arises, all arise because of the fool, not the wise man. Anytime you hear the word wise or wisdom, it's talking about how you recognize the links of dependent origination. Many times people have fear arising and they get so involved in the fear, they just cause themselves a lot of suffering. And that is being foolish. Thus the fool brings fear, the wise man brings no fear. The fool brings trouble, the wise man brings no trouble. The fool brings calamity, the wise man brings no calamity. No fear comes from the wise man, no trouble comes from the wise man. No calamity comes from the wise man. Therefore, you should train thus. We shall be wise people. We shall be inquirers. How does fear arise? What happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? You want to start seeing everything that arises as part of an impersonal process. Nobody's going to say, well, I haven't had any fear arise for a while, I might as well be afraid. But once that feeling arises, if you indulge in it, it's going to get worse. You're feeding it. So that's why the six R's are so important. You recognize that your mind is distracted. You release the distraction. If the distraction is fear, you don't keep your mind on it. You let it be there by itself and relax. Now you've let go of that false idea in a personal self that I am afraid. Then you bring up something wholesome smile. Now this is a smiling meditation. As odd as it sounds, this is something that you don't hear from other meditation teachers. I think I'm the only one in the country that tells you this. I want you to smile all the time. Why? because it improves your mindfulness and your progress in the meditation is much better. I want you to laugh with yourself if you get caught by an attachment. If you get caught in fear, the fastest way to let fear go is laugh because your mind is being dumb. It's indulging in that fear. And I want you to have fun. Now this is 
a silent retreat. When I say laugh, I just mean kind of chuckle in your mind at how, mind, how your mind can be so dumb to get caught up in this stuff. So, when this was said, the Venerable asked, the Venerable Ananda asked the Blessed One, in what way, Venerable Sir, can a person be called a wise man, an inquirer? When Ananda, a person is skilled in the elements, skilled in the bases, skilled in dependent origination, skilled in what is possible and what is impossible. In that way, you can be called a wise man, an inquirer. Dry hands. Now we're going to go to the elements. But Venerable Sir, in what way can a person be called skilled in the elements? Here, Ananda, these 18 elements, the I element, the form element, the I consciousness element, the ear element, the sound element, the ear consciousness element, the nose element, the odor element, the nose consciousness element, the tongue element, the flavor element, the tongue consciousness element, the body element, the tangible element, the body consciousness element, mind element, the mind object element, the mind consciousness element. When he knows and sees these 18 elements, a person can, can be called one skilled in the elements. So in order to see, you have to have a good working eye. There has to be color and form, and then eye consciousness arises. Now with the meeting of these three different things from the eye, this is called eye contact. And that's one of the links of dependent origination is contact. When that contact arises, right after that feeling arises, Feeling is not emotion. Feeling is either pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. <coughs> right after that feeling arises, craving arises. Craving is that tension and tightness that comes in your head, in your mind. Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. If it's a pleasant feeling, I like it. If it's a painful feeling, I don't like it. If you don't relax right then, then clinging arises. Clinging is all of your stories, all of your thoughts, all of your opinions and concepts about why you like or dislike that, that feeling that arose. Clinging is where you really strongly take things personally. You identify with that. This is me, this is my thought, this is my opinion, and I'm always right. Right after that arises, then your habitual tendency arises. This is where your emotional states arise. 
the strong desire to control things arise. Now, you just heard me say that whatever sense door that arises, it's an impersonal process. It happens because conditions are right for it to be there, right? When the eye hits color and form, that consciousness arises. The beating of these three is called eye contact. With eye contact as condition, I feeling arises. With I feeling as condition, craving arises. That's the I, I like it, I don't like it. That's the very beginning of taking things personally, which later manifests as emotional uh, attachments. Now, you're, you're made up of five different things. You have a body, you have feeling, pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. You have perception. That's the part of the mind that puts a name with the, that feeling. Okay, it says it's either pleasant or it's painful. So feeling and perception are always conjoined. They're always together. Right after that, craving arises. That's where you start taking it on personally. Now, This is your brain. Around this brain is a membrane called the meninges. Every time you have a thought, every time a feeling arises, every time a sensation arises, the brain expands a little bit and it causes tension and tightness to arise in your head. So every time you see this or recognize that there's tension and tightness, relax, let it be. So right after perception, there are formations that arise. I call these formation mostly your thinking. And then there's consciousness. So there's these five aggregates. When a feeling arises, and it's a painful feeling and you don't like it, the natural tendency is to try to think the feeling away. But feelings are one thing, and thoughts are something else. The, the two never get together. And the more you think a feeling, the more you try to control the feeling with your thoughts, the bigger and more intense that feeling becomes. Until it turns it into an emergency and you can't stand it. So it's real important for you to understand the necessity to use the six R's. You recognize when your mind is distracted away from your object of meditation. You release the distraction. You don't get involved in thinking about it. You don't get involved in anything except let it be there by itself. Don't keep your attention on it. If you keep your attention on it, if you make it a big deal, guess who's going to have a lot of distractions because of that? Because I don't like it. I don't want it to be there. 
the truth is whatever arises in the present it's there if it's a painful feeling the truth is it's painful but what are you supposed to do with this you allow it to be there by itself most people when they have a painful feeling they do this with their mind I don't like it I want it to stop I want it to go away it's disturbing my meditation and the tighter you squeeze around it the more the hindrance really turns into a problem now the truth is when the feeling is there it's there that tight mental fist around it is your identifying with it and trying to make that feeling go away with your thoughts and that only makes you squeeze tighter now I say if it's a painful feeling any kind of emotional upset is a painful feeling this meditation you will be teaching yourself major lessons by direct experience you'll see that as, as you go deeper how you cause yourself pain by trying to control the present moment but the truth is when whatever happens in the present moment it's there anytime you try to fight with it anytime you try to change it any try to anytime you try to control it you're fighting with the truth and as a result a lot more suffering so when you open up and allow that painful feeling to be there by itself and you don't make a big deal out of it in your mind it will take care of itself it'll eventually fade away by itself because you're not feeding it with your attention so you allow it to be there by itself you relax the tightness caused by that you smile return to your object of meditation stay with your object of meditation for as long as you can that's the six R's you can't use the six R's as some kind of stick to make it stop happening that's not the function of the six R's I had somebody tell me today that they oh relax 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 no that doesn't work why doesn't it work because you're not doing the whole process that needs to be done you have to use all the six R's oh but I have this tightness and I don't like it I don't want it there who's fighting with the tightness who doesn't want it there who's causing themselves suffering because they're trying to control see the whole thing comes down to your job is simply to observe to allow whatever arises to be there by itself but don't keep your attention on it smile when you smile your mind becomes light when you relax that tightness in your head even if it doesn't go away right away never mind bring back that wholesomeness of the light mind and 
stay with your object of meditation for as long as you can. It doesn't matter how many times your mind gets distracted. What matters is what you do with it when you are distracted. Why do distractions arise? Because in the past you have broken precepts. Now every morning I ask you to take the precepts. Not as some kind of rite and ritual, but as a reminder that you want to keep these precepts as closely as you can. All day. And when you get off retreat, keep the precepts as closely as you can. And your mind will naturally become more peaceful and calm. Now, every time a hindrance arises, it is your teacher. What is it teaching you? Where your attachment is. When you break up a precept, you kill something, you steal something, you have wrong sexual activity, you have tell lies. and curse, or curse, or gossip, or use speech to divide people up. When you break those precepts, as soon as you do it, that little quiet mind in your, that little quiet voice in your mind tells you, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have done that. And that's where you start taking things personally. And that starts clouding the way you see the world. Now, what you're going to be learning here is how to let go of that. How to purify your mind. Every time you use the six R's, you're making your mind pure. Every time you let it be and relax and smile and bring that smiling light mind that's pure because you've let go of the craving back to your object of meditation. Stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. The six R's are a guideline in what to do. You don't, well, now I recognize that, now I'm going to release this. No, you don't do that in your mind. You roll your R's together. So it's a very fast process. So it's a real interesting thing that whenever any kind of disturbance pulls your attention away from your object of meditation, it is because you've broken a precept at some point. You might not know what it was that you broke, it doesn't matter. What matters is what are you going to do with that right now? You allow it to be, you relax, you smile, you come back to your object of meditation. That's how you purify your mind. That's how there's personality development. <coughs> Excuse me. So every time a hindrance arises, it is showing you exactly where your attachment is. And you can let it go and be there by yourself. 
smile, come back to your object of meditation, stay with your object of meditation for as long as you can. <coughs> your object of meditation is your home base. Always go home. Now, you can be with your object to meditation and it doesn't really pull your attention away when some thoughts come up. If you can stay with your object to meditation, ignore those thoughts. Just ignore it. Never mind. Release them, relax, smile, and come and stay with your object to meditation. So when when you're you have distracting thoughts arise, but you're still staying with your object of meditation, ignore those thoughts. <coughs> this place is doing it to me again. So it's important that you understand the only time you need the six R's is when your mind is distracted away from your object of meditation, when you're caught thinking about this or that. I've had some students, they've even been some advanced students and they tell me well, I had this hindrance come up and I released it and I relaxed and I released and I relaxed and I released and I relaxed and it didn't work. Well, of course not. You're only using half the formula. You have to smile. You have to bring that smiling pure mind back to your object of meditation. If you're just relax, 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 or release, relax, release, relax, there's somebody that doesn't like what arose in their mind and they're trying to control it. <coughs> Is that on? So when you follow these directions closely, as you smile more, your mindfulness gets better. And I mean all the time. I don't care if you're taking a shower, you're doing a job around here, whatever you're doing, smile. If you follow that simple direction, your progress will be very fast. Smile into everything. Don't take things personally. When you're walking, stay with your object of meditation and smile. Don't walk slowly. Walk at a normal pace. Some people, I even have them walking quickly. Because they, they, if you sit for a long peri period of time, the blood settles and you need to get it moving again. But stay with your object of meditation. <clears throat> But venerable sir, might there be another way in which a person can be called skilled in the elements? Yes, there is, Ananda. There are these six elements, the earth element, water element, fire element, air element, space element, and consciousness element. When he knows and sees these six elements, a person can be called skilled in the elements. Now the water element is very, uh, it, it's an easy simile to show you what I'm talking about. 
When water is running in a stream and it hits a rock, does it try to move that rock out of the way? Or does it just go around it? That's what you do with all distractions. Just let it be there by itself. Relax, smile, come back to your object of meditation. So treat everything like the water. <clears throat> it runs into a rock, it runs into a tree. Does it get upset because that tree or rock is there? No, it just accepts that it's there and let your mind, let it be by itself. Don't try to control it. But venerable sir, might there be another way in which a monk can be called skilled in the elements? Yes, there is. The six elements, the pleasure element, the pain element, the joy element, the grief element, the equanimity element, and the ignorance element. <coughs> When he knows these six elements, a monk can be, or a person can be skilled in the elements. Okay. <coughs> this is talking about having accepting mind no matter what element arises. The ignorance element is not understanding how the Four Noble Truths actually work. There is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is a cessation of suffering and the way leading to the cessation. Being able to see this, not intellectualize about it, not analyze it, see it as it actually is, will lead you to a very quiet, peaceful mind. But sir, might there be another way in which a monk can be called skilled in the elements? Yes, Ananda. There are these six elements. The sense desire element the renunciation element. Renunciation here means letting go of craving, letting go of that tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. The ill will element, the non ill will element, the cruelty element, and the non cruelty element. So this is talking about lust, Renunciation, letting it be, relaxing, not getting involved in it. The ill will element, I don't like it, I don't want it to be there. What's the non-ill will element? Loving kindness. The cruelty element the non-cruelty element. What is a cruelty, non-cruelty element? Compassion. Loving kindness and compassion are very close together, but they're not exactly the same. When you do this meditation, like I'm showing you, as you progress further, you'll be able to see that directly for yourself. When he knows and sees these six elements, a monk can be called, or a person can be called skilled in the elements. But venerable sir, he really has a lot of the same questions. Might there be another way in which a person can be called skilled in the elements? Yes, Ananda, there are these three elements the sense sphere element, 
the fine material element. The fine material element means getting into a jhana. Now there's a lot of misunderstanding about that kind of word, jhana. It's a Pali word and almost everybody translates it as concentration, but it's not. It is a stage or level of your understanding. The first jhana, you have a certain kind of understanding. You get to the second jhana, it's a different kind of understanding because your experience is different. And it goes all the way to the fourth jhana. These are called the material, uh, fine material element. And then there's the immaterial element. <clears throat> that means infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing, neither perception or non-perception. These states are only experienced through mind. When you get into these states, you don't have a body anymore. You're in a fine, super fine material or immaterial realm where it's just mental. <clears throat> when he knows and sees these three elements, a monk can be called skilled in the elements. But, venerable sir, might there be another way in which a person can be called skilled in the elements? There might be. There are these two elements, the conditioned element, that means everything that's in the world, and the unconditioned element. The unconditioned element is Nibbana. There's no conditions there. So you have trouble talking about it because you only talk in concepts. You only talk in conditioned things. It's something that has to be experienced by yourself. When he knows and sees these two elements, a person can be called skilled in the elements. But venerable sir, in what way can a person be called skilled in the bases? There are, Ananda, six internal and external bases. Now we already talked about that here. That's the eye and color and form. Color and form is the external base. The eye is the internal base. And it's the same with the ear, the nose, whatever. <clears throat> that is the eye and forms, the ear and sounds, the nose and odors, the tongue and flavors, the body and tangibles, mind and mind objects. When he knows and sees these internal and external bases, a person can be called skilled in the bases. But venerable sir, in what way can a person be called skilled in dependent origination? Here, when this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. So you have color and form in the eye consciousness. They make contact. Then there's feeling, pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. Then there's craving. Now each one of these things, they won't arise if conditions aren't arise, uh, right for them to arise. So, as soon as feeling starts to come up 
and you recognize that feeling is there and you relax, you use the six R's right at that moment, then craving won't arise. And if craving won't arise, clinging won't arise. If clinging won't arise, habitual tendency won't arise. If habitual tendency doesn't arise, a birth of action doesn't arise. If birth of action doesn't arise, there is no sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, or despair arising. So you get to see how incredibly important it is to use the six R's. <clears throat> when this does not exist, so if you let go of that craving or that that feeling, then craving won't arise. Now your mind is pure. And when you let go of that, there's no more clinging. No more opinions, no more ideas. Now you're starting to see how this process actually does work. Without taking it personally. Everything in this world is actually part of an impersonal process. But because we've been raised to think that everything is me, it's mine, it's who I am. And we're not taught to keep the precepts so closely, so we break them. And then we get caught up in emotional upsets and, and arguments and, and all kinds of problems. And all kinds of suffering. When you start going from one jhana to the next, which you will, if you follow the directions the way that I give them. And these aren't my directions, by the way, they are the Buddha's. If you follow these directions closely, you will progress very quickly. And to be quite honest, I'm used to people going very quickly in the meditation. I'm used to it. If you don't follow the directions, then your progress is going to slow down and I get grumpy. So please listen closely to what I've been talking about. With the cessation of this, that ceases. So, with the cessation of craving, clinging ceases. With the cessation of that, habitual tendency cease. And the meditation starts to get to be real fun. I've done a lot of meditation. Sometimes people come and they think that, they, well, I don't really know what I'm doing with the meditation. I've done a lot. I've done roughly 12 three-month retreats. I did an eight-month retreat. I did a two-year retreat. And I've done a lot of one-month retreats. I really do understand how mind works. When I started going to the suttas and examining what the suttas were talking about, it changed the way I did the meditation. Because I was just a dumb American, I followed the instructions of whoever was teaching the meditation and I, I wound up suffering a lot for the first 20 years of my practice. The last 22 or 23 years have been a 
lot more fun. And what I found out is if you don't have this relaxed step, then what happens is you're with your object of meditation, it gets distracted. You're supposed to let that be and immediately come back to your object of meditation. That's what I was basically taught. Or I was taught there is something as it is a distraction, then I note that distraction until it goes away and then come back to my object of meditation. Both of those methods are bringing the craving back to your object of meditation. So, it leads you off of the path of the Buddha's teaching with what I'm showing you now <clears throat> your mind is on your object of meditation, that's the same. You get distracted, that's the same. But you use the six R's and you relax and smile and come back to the object of meditation. Now what happens in your mind when you smile or when you relax? Your mind becomes clear, your mind becomes bright. You don't have any distractions in your mind. And you bring that mind to something wholesome, smile, come back to your object of meditation. Your mind is pure at that time because you've let go of craving. The other kinds of meditation, they don't tell you about craving, so you don't even notice that you have it. As a result, there's no real personality change. When you start letting go of the craving, when you let it be and relax, your mind starts to lose more and more old habitual ways that cause suffering. You start losing that. Right now your roller coaster mind is going, I like this, I don't like that. I like this, I don't like that. And when you do that for a whole day, you go home and you're exhausted. You need to get a lot of sleep. But as you learn this, as you learn to relax that tension and tightness in your head, you still have some highs and some lows, but they're not so, so radical. And you catch them more quickly. You see that you're causing yourself pain. You take responsibility for causing yourself pain and you let go of that. And you start developing more and more equanimity in your mind. So, stuff can happen, <clears throat> but you don't get so excited with it anymore. So it's a real interesting thing that other people around you, when you go home, you're gonna, they're going to start saying, you're different. You have more balance in your mind now. I want some of that. So it's a real interesting thing that you <coughs> understand that this is a process that will lead to your happiness and well-being for a long time. There's a lot of benefit in practicing this. Okay. Okay, when it does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of it, that ceases, that is. 
with ignorance as conditions, formations come to be. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition, <coughs> craving comes to be. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual tendency comes to be. With habitual tendency as condition, birth of action comes to be. With birth of action as condition, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair comes to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. This is why it's called dependent origination. Because this comes up, then that's, that's the condition for the next link to come up. But with the remainderless and fading away, cessation of ignorance comes. Cessation of formations. With the cessation of formation, cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of mentality, materiality. With the cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of the sixfold base. With the cessation of the sixfold base, cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact, cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of habitual tendency. With the cessation of habitual tendency, cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. In this way, Ananda, a person can be called skilled in dependent origination. Now you'll be able to see all of these and you're going to hear a lot more in the Dhamma talks about these. <coughs> but venerable sir, in what way <coughs> can a person be called skilled in what is possible and what is impossible? Here Ananda, a monk understands it is impossible, it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could treat any formation as permanent. There's no such a possibility. Everything is a state of change. It's in a state of flux. I tell you, I want you to sit without moving your body. Can you do that? No, because your blood's moving. Your molecules are moving around. Your atoms and electrons and protons and all the quarks and all of that kind of stuff is moving. The earth is moving. Nothing is permanent. Everything is in a state of change. And everything is part of an impersonal process. It's not you, it's not yours. It just is the way it works. And he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might treat some formation as permanent. 
there is such a possibility he understands it is impossible it cannot be it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could treat any formation as plausible there is no such personality he understands it is possible for an ordinary person might treat some formation as pleasurable. There's, there is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen, that a person possessing right view could treat anything as theirs personally. There is no such a possibility. A person with right view sees things as they actually are. They're rising and passing away continually. And that happens while you're in each of the jhanas. And he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might treat something as theirs personally. There is such a possibility, but they're not seeing things as they truly are. They're taking everything as being me, mine. This is who I am. And the truth is, that is just an arising and passing away of phenomena. It's all impersonal. <coughs> He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen, that a, a person possessing right view that could deprive his mother of life. There is no such possibility. Now, this is keeping your precepts without killing or harming living beings. And he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might deprive his mother of life. There is such a possibility if they don't truly understand the way these things work. You would never even consider harming your mother or father or relatives or any other person. You just wouldn't consider it. It is impossible, it cannot happen, that a person possessing right view could deprive his father of life or an arahat of life. There is no such possibility, and he understands it's Im it is possible an ordinary person might deprive his father or an arahat of life. There is such a possibility, it can happen but they really suffer for it for long, long periods of time. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could have a mind of hate, shed a Tathagata's blood. There is no such possibility and he understands it is possible for an ordinary person with a mind of hate, it is possible they could shed the Tathagata's blood. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible. It cannot happen that a person possessing right view, that means keeping your precepts without breaking them it can cause a schism in the Sangha could acknowledge another teacher. Now that's hard to do when you are your own teacher. You don't need to acknowledge other people. There's, I just got through watching a, a thing on uh, YouTube about Rajneesh and they all, oh, he is my teacher and I have to be around him and I, put him above anything that I want to do. No, that, that is wrong. And in India, and in 
Tibetan Buddhism. You got to follow the guru. They are your teacher. No, you are your own teacher. You can follow advice if it helps your mind to be more peaceful and calm. <clears throat> he understands it is possible that an ordinary person might cause a schism in the Sangha or might acknowledge another teacher. There is a possibility that there are people with weak minds that they want to give all their power away to the teacher. A true teacher is just going to truly show you how you use your own power. I can't give you any power. I can help you to understand how to use it. But you're not getting it from me, you're getting it from yourself. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen, that two accomplished ones, fully awakened ones, could arise at the same time in one world system. There's no such a possibility. Buddha image, Buddhas only appear every now and then. Sometimes there's a long period of time between the, this Buddha and the next. There's a false belief out there that, oh, this Maitreya Buddha, he's, he, he can appear right now. No, he can't. Maitreya cannot appear right now. It's an impossibility because this is a Buddha era where the Gotama Buddha has, still has the dispensation, still have the teachings of the Buddha. They don't ever overlap. And he understands it is possible that one accomplished one, fully awakened, might arise in one world system. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen, that two wheel-turning monarchs can arise together in one world system. The wheel-turning mo monarch is somebody that they stay a layman, but they, uh, turn out to be a world the, in their world, wherever that world happens to be, they are the ruler. This, this is one of the things that gets a lot of women upset. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen, that a woman could be a wheel-turning monarch or a fully awakened being. Why is that? much easier to be a man than it is a woman. Women have their own aches and pains, they have their own, uh, that they just have a, a body that does not tend to being healthy all the time. And that's, I'm, that's as far as I'm going with that, I'm not going anymore. <laughs> It's just easier being a man than it is a woman. And you know that it's true. What, when you're, when you're growing up and it's time for the bleeding to start? Men don't have those kind of problems. They don't have those emotional times when their body really hurts. 
Men don't have that problem. And he understands it is possible. Well, there it is. I'm not going to do that. He understands it's impossible, cannot happen, that a wished for, desired, agreeable result could be produced from bodily misconduct, from verbal misconduct, or from mental misconduct. It just, you don't get what you're after when you break the precepts. There's a saying in Buddhism that when you take care of Dhamma, Dhamma takes care of you. And it's really true. You keep your precepts. Don't break them for any reason at all. And after a few years, there's a necessity for something that would be nice to have around. It would be some kind of tool that you need. It will manifest itself. I mean, I'm a monk. I'm poor. But how can I build this? How can I build all of these different cabins and such. I don't have any money. But people think well enough of the Buddha's teaching and keeping precepts as closely as I can, these things just start to manifest by themselves. Don't have to think about money. Isn't that sweet? don't have to get involved with it. <clears throat> it is possible that an unwished for, undesired, disagreeable result can be produced from bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, and mental misconduct. There is that possibility, so be careful and keep your precepts. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen, that an unwished for, undesired, disagreeable result can be produced from good bodily conduct, from good verbal conduct, from good mental conduct. There is no way that bad stuff is going to happen for you. Keeping your precepts is a kind of protection. You will know what to do at the right time. When you get in a stressful situation, you'll know what to do, how to help, without having to think about it. You'll just see the situation, you know how to fix it, okay, then you fix it right then. But people that get overexcited they don't know what to do. I was up well, probably as high as a pinnacle of this roof and I slipped and fell off the roof. And I made the mistake and it was really dumb that I put my hand down to catch myself and I broke my wrist. One of the people that, I, that was working for me at the time, he, he was short-lived, he didn't work there very long. He came running up to me and he said, are you hurt? And I said, yeah, I think I broke my wrist. So you know what he did? He took my hand and did this. And I told him in no uncertain terms that he better move away. But I did break my wrist. But it could have killed me, and it didn't. I could have landed on my head. I would have done it right there. I was, I, it was a long ways up.
okay. It is possible that a wished for desire, wished for desired agreeable result might be produced from good bodily conduct, good verbal conduct, good mental conduct. There is such a possibility. He understands it is impossible, it cannot happen, that a person in engaging in bodily misconduct, engaging in verbal misconduct, in, in engaging in mental misconduct, could on account of that, for that reason, on a dissolution after body, after death, reappear in a happy destination. There's no such a possibility. And he understands it is possible that a person engaging in bodily misconduct, engaging in verbal misconduct, engaging in mental misconduct, on that account, for that reason, on the dissolution of a body after death, reappear re re in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, even in hell. There is such a, per a possibility. He understands it's impossible, it cannot happen that a person engaging in good bodily conduct, engaging in good verbal conduct, engaging in good mental conduct, would be on account of that, for that reason, on the dissolution of the body after death, reappear in a state of deprivation. So, what does that tell you? Keep your precepts, don't break them. Practice your generosity. The thing that's real interesting about generosity is almost everybody thinks that generosity has to be with money, and it doesn't. Can you smile? Can you give your smile to someone else? Can you have happy thoughts and wish other people happiness? That's practicing your generosity. And he understands it is possible for a person engaging in good bodily conduct, verbal conduct, and mental conduct on that account, for that reason on the dissolution of the body after death, reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. In this way, Ananda, a person can be called skilled in what is possible and what is impossible. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, it is wonderful, Venerable Sir, it is marvelous. What is the name of the, this discourse on the Dhamma? You may remember this discourse on the Dhamma Ananda as the many kinds of elements and as the four cycles and as the mirror of the Dhamma and as the drum of the deathless, as the supreme victory in battle. <coughs> That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this gives you an idea more of what you're doing and the importance of keeping the precepts and not taking whatever arises as being yours personally. I'm afraid, I'm mad, I want. Who? Who wants it? I do. Who's taking it personally and being unhappy because it doesn't happen the way they want it to? I do. Who's causing them self-pain? I am. You can't blame anything else. You can't blame any other situation. 
sometimes people will come and they'll oh they give me all kinds of excuses I don't buy excuses there's some forbidden words that I don't let people use yes but that's just an uh, another way of saying I'm take, not taking responsibility for myself. I have an idea of the way I want it to be and I don't get it and I'm not happy. But it hurts. Okay, so there's pain sometimes. Sometimes there's pleasure. Pain and pleasure, same coin, different sides. You have to allow it to be. Use the six R's, relax, smile. Come back to your object of meditation. Okay, I've been talking for a long time. Okay, let's share some merit then. <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.